Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you all for being here. It's great to be talking to you. I'm also flattered to be sharing the stage, not for the first time, with Bina, um, whose book is also fantastic. And I look forward to hearing her spiel um, when I'm done. So I'm here, um, as Alan just suggested, I'm here to talk to you a bit about climate change. But I'm not only going to talk about climate change. I also want to talk about some things um, that lie beyond the science of warming. The name of the subtitle of my book is Life After Warming. And while I do, in it, try to survey the state of climate change and what we know the future is likely to look like in the decades ahead, I also try to ask questions about how that science will change our politics and our geopolitics, how it will change our culture, our culture of storytelling, how it will change our emotional lives and psychology, how it will change our sense of our place in history, um, which we may have long understood to be a story of progress, but which is emerging as a much more complicated story in a time of climate change, and how it may change our sense of our place in nature. Um, but before I get to those questions, I want to tell you a little bit more about myself and how I came to this subject, because it's not the most usual, typical path. I'm not, I still don't think of myself as an environmentalist, even though I've spent the last few years working really deeply on this material. Um, I've never even thought of myself as a nature person. I've never gone camping, I've never gone on a hike, never owned any pets. Um, I think of myself as a, you know, I come to the subject from the humanities, um, not from science, and I am a journalist, not an advocate. I've lived my whole life in cities, actually just one city, New York City. And <laughs> while I always thought that it was nice to like go on trips to visit nature, um, I also thought that all of modern life was a fortress that protected me against it, and that in fact allowed me to live entirely outside of nature, independent of its impacts. Which meant, like a lot of people I know, I, I would guess like a lot of people in this room, and like a lot of college freshmen, um, that I live most of my life complacent and deluded about the scale of climate change and what it would mean for the way that we live. I thought that it was happening slowly, happening elsewhere, and that it represented only a really modest threat to the way that I and my loved ones lived. In each of these ways, I was very, very wrong. Climate change is happening very quickly, so quickly that its dramatic impacts are being seen already today and will be coming even faster in the years ahead. It is everywhere and inescapable. No matter who you are or where you live, your life will be affected by this in the years ahead. And it will probably be quite a bit worse than we we're taught to expect, which means that the ways that it will transform our lives on this planet are much more dramatic than I think many of us have really begun to come to terms with. And I want to talk about each of these three delusions in turn, not just because I think my own awakening was a kind of representative one, and not just because I think talking about the delusions can help us think a little bit more clearly about the future we're likely heading towards, but because I think taken together, they give us a really clear portrait of climate change as the story of our age. And maybe even more than that, as the meta-narrative of our time, the thing that is affecting and possibly even governing everything we know about the rest of this century. So the first big delusion was about speed. Um, when I first learned about climate change, I was growing up in school and then as a young adult watching Inconvenient Truth, watching the TV news, reading the newspaper accounts, I understood climate change to be a very slow process. I thought it had begun in the Industrial Revolution and it had fallen to us to clean up the mess that our grandparents left behind so that our grandchildren wouldn't be left with the consequences. In other words, it was a story of centuries, we were told. But in fact, half of all of the emissions that have ever been produced in the entire history of humanity from the burning of fossil fuels have come in the last 30 years. 
So that's since Al Gore published his first book on warming. And it's since the UN established its IPCC climate change body, signaling unmistakably to the world that there was a scientific consensus about climate change and the threat it represented to modern life. We've done more damage since then than in all of the centuries, indeed all of the millennia, that came before, which means we've done more damage knowingly than we ever managed in ignorance. Now, I'm 37 years old, which means my life contains this entire story. When I was born, the planet's climate seemed stable. Scientists were worried about the medium term and the long term, but for the foreseeable future, things looked okay. And here we are just a few decades later, sitting on the brink of catastrophe because of what has happened in those intervening decades. A college freshman stepping onto college campus today has been alive for fully 35% of all of the emissions that have ever been produced in the entire history of humanity. 25% of them have been produced since the introduction of the iPhone. We are doing this damage unbelievably rapidly and we're now beginning to see those impacts in real time. You can see them in the incredible heat waves. Last week it was 70 degrees in Antarctica. It was hotter in Antarctica than it was in Delhi. Last summer, there were record heat waves in Europe in June, breaking records that had been set for decades. New records were set in July, and then approached again in August. So records that used to hold for decades or centuries were effectively broken three times in a single summer. You can see these impacts in the American Midwest, where last spring we had such unprecedented flooding that whole states were underwater for months at a time the interruption to the planting season was so profound that last year, American farmers drew fully 40% of their income from bailout money and insurance money. And they're expecting similar floods again this year. And of course, you can see these impacts maybe most dramatically in Australia, where there have, there have been fires, not just a fire season, there have been single fires burning since September, five months ago. 15 times as much land has burned than burned in the worst California season in wildfire history. Sydney's air quality registered so dirty, it was 100 times as polluted as the WHO says it's safe to breathe. They had to suspend ferry service because the boats couldn't navigate the smoke. Fire alarms in office buildings were going off because they thought that the fire was in the building. And scientists believe that one billion animals or more were killed. I come to the subject as a human, I say often I'm a human chauvinist, I really care about the well-being of humans much more than animals of ecos or ecosystems, and yet one billion animals. I mean, really. <laughs> but my favorite, favorite is a bit of a weird word, my, um, the example that I come back to again and again when talking about the real-time arrival of climate impacts is the experience of the city of Houston. This is a city that last summer was vis visited by its fifth 500 year storm in five years. Now that term has lost some of its meaning in a time of climate change, but I think it's useful to remember what it was supposed to mean, which is a storm you'd expect to hit once every 500 years. 500 years ago, Hernando Cortez had just landed in Mexico. There were no European settlements in North America at all. So we're talking about a storm you'd expect to hit once during that entire history. The arrival of Europeans in North America, the establishing of colonies, the waging of a genocide against the native people, the fighting of a revolution, the building of a slave empire, the fighting of a civil war, industrialization, World War I, the Depression, World War II, the Cold War, the American Empire, the end of the Cold War, the end of history, September 11th, the financial crisis, one storm in that entire time. And Houston's now been hit by five of them in the last five years. We're dealing with extreme weather and natural disaster that should have taken place over millennia, compressed into the period of just a few years. This is not the story of centuries, and it is not a slow saga. It is a fast story 
in the work of a single generation, ours. The second big delusion I had was about the scope of climate change, which you know I heard a lot about Arctic melt and sea level rise, and so I thought that was the biggest threat. Sea level rise is a problem, but actually its most dramatic impacts are gonna unfold over centuries, which means presumably we'll have some time to adapt. Many of the other aspects of climate change are not nearly as delayed, and none of them give the misleading impression that sea level rise does, that if we live anywhere but the coast, we'll be safe. As I mentioned earlier, I've come to see this as a truly all-encompassing, all-touching threat, which affects every aspect of human life. So there are economists who believe that globally, the GDP could be 30% smaller than it would be without climate change by the end of the century, 30% smaller. That's an impact that's twice as deep as the Great Depression and it would be permanent. There's an effect on agriculture whose grain yields could drop by 50% over the course of the century just by the impact of temperature. There's an impact on conflict because there's a relationship between temperature and violence. Scientists studying this expect that by the end of the century, if we don't change course, we could have at least twice as much war as we have today. Which means, of course, that climate change is yielding up challenges to all of us thinking about the world in terms of political science and economics, in terms of biology and environmental science, in terms of agriculture, all of that. There are also effects on um, uh, sorry, in addition to conflict between states, there are also effects um, on violence between individuals. So when it's hotter out, rates of rape and murder and domestic assault go up. So if you care about crime or violence against women, climate change has a fingerprint there as well. There's an effect on cognitive performance. Um, an incredible study in Los Angeles found that just by putting... Um, an air filter in a classroom to suck out the pollutants that are produced from the burning of fossil fuels. It had the same effect on student performance as having the class class sized it. Temperature also affects um, learning and cognitive performance. It also affects aspects of mental health. Pollution and temperature both raise rates of schizophrenia and autism and ADHD. They change the rates of premature birth and low birth weight. Almost every aspect of life that you could possibly imagine bears some fingerprint at least, and maybe more than that, a boot print of climate change. And that means for all of us and all of the students that we work with, whenever we are thinking about how the world will take shape and how to respond to those changes, climate change plays a role, at the very least. Then the third big um, delusion I had was about the severity of climate change. I heard a lot for a very long time about this level of warming two degrees Celsius. Scientists call it the threshold of catastrophe. Island nations of the world call it genocide. They always said when they talked about it, we have to do everything we can to avoid two degrees. I got the impression that meant it was kind of a worst case scenario. But I think given where we are today, practically speaking, it's much more like a best case scenario. Let me tell you a little bit about why I think that. Today, the planet's about 1.1 degrees warmer than it was before the Industrial Revolution, which doesn't sound like much, but it already makes the planet warmer than it has ever been in recorded, his recorded human history. There's more carbon in the atmosphere today. There's so much carbon in the atmosphere today that the last time we were at that level, there were palm trees in the Arctic and there was nothing like mammal life could have survived anywhere near the equator. The planet wasn't two degrees or three degrees or four degrees warmer, it was eight degrees warmer. Scientists say that even if we totally zeroed out on carbon today, we would probably be due for about another half degree of warming more, which would bring us north of 1.5 degrees to about 1.6, maybe 1.7 degrees of warming. And because I think that that path is, given all the obstacles we face in our politics and our culture and our economics, a little hopeful, I think something like two degrees is, again, really our best case scenario. And at that level, scientists say storms that today arrive once every century would be hitting 
every year. Cities in South Asia and the Middle East that are today home to 10 or 12 or 15 million people would be so hot during summer that during heat waves you wouldn't be able to walk around outside without risking heat stroke or death, which is one reason why the UN believes at that level two degrees, which would arrive, we think, probably 2040, 2050, that globally we could be dealing with 200 million climate refugees, possibly more. Scientists say at two degrees, 153 million additional people would die of air pollution. That's death at the scale of 25 holocausts. And we'd be locking into inevitability the permanent loss of all the planet's ice sheets, which would take centuries, but over time would bring about, about 250 feet of sea level rise, enough to drown at least two-thirds of the world's major cities and maybe 80% if we didn't move them, which probably we would. Now, that's just two degrees, which as I said, is about our best case scenario. Some of that information may be a little, in the end, alarmist or apocalyptic, because of course we will be adapting and responding to these changes as they arrive. But adapting and responding and accommodating ourselves to what level of suffering and what amount of unprecedented strife? That's the question. I think almost no matter what we do, we will be dealing with a dramatically different world lived on in dramatically different ways. And that may all sound like bad news, um, which it is, it is bad news. <laughs> but I think it contains a little bit of a silver lining, um, which is this. As terrifying as these scenarios sound, ultimately they are a reflection of our power over the climate. If we get to these places, if we get to two degrees, even though I think we will, if we get to three degrees, if we get to four degrees, it will be because of choices we make from here going forward. It sounds a little Pollyanna-ish to say, but the main driver of climate change is human action, so theoretically at least, we can make different choices, our hands are on those levers, and we can write the story of the planet's climate future ourselves. In fact, not just can, we will, because since inaction is just another form of action, we're gonna be writing that story whether we like it or not, and not just writing it, but living it, and not just as observers, but as protagonists. And this isn't just any story. It's a purpose-giving story. Scientists say we have about 30 years to take action to really avoid climate change's worst case scenarios, which means for everyone in this room, and certainly for any college freshman stepping onto campus this fall, their life will contain that part of the story too. What happens next? They won't just be taking action to shape that future though, they will also be trying to understand it. What it means to live in an era that isn't where the term new normal no longer applies and we can only refer to the past and say, at what point marked the end of normal, past which everything changes. I think we're only beginning to really think about what it will mean to live past the end of normal, what it will mean for our storytelling to see a world, a real world, that resembles in many ways the apocalyptic scenarios imagined by science fiction writers and Hollywood movie makers for, for generations what kind of stories we will tell ourselves in that environment, or how it will change our politics to have 10 times or maybe hundreds of times more refugees than we have today. We already are living in a world when many nations are retreating from a sense of global cooperation and embracing more nativistic, nationalistic policies. Will that continue as climate change comes to do dominate the, um, the story of geopolitics? I can't say for sure, but I know that the entire discipline of international relations and foreign policy, all of that will be changed, as will our sense of domestic responsibilities. And what we owe one another as humans alive on this planet. These are not all new questions, but climate change asks us them in a much more urgent way than I think they've ever been asked before. 
And I think we owe it to ourselves and to young people especially to try to start to think about how to answer those questions, not just to allow us to design and engineer our way towards a relatively livable, relatively prosperous, and relatively just future, but in which we can help them find meaning in a world that is transformed by these forces, as science tells us it will. Thank you. <laughs>